Everyone ready? Then uh, let's have a look at the second session of the day of the course on abstract and utility commodity. Okay, we stay with the abstract for now. I start with the poll who knows simplicial sets? And well, I don't have even have to ask all men what to do with them. <laughs> so let's have an interlude. <coughs> Do I need to number it? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. The simplicity set is the following. It's Start with, a, with another thing. Uh, delta is the name of category. It's the category of finite linearly ordered sets. Maybe I should say non-empty. I don't know if you consider the empty set is ordered. And all of these are morphisms. So these these uh, sets are denoted like this. I mean, for every natural number, there's up to isomorphism one such set, and it can be ordered like this: from zero to n. This is like I call the nth. Set. The zero set it's just it's just one of them. no particular order in there, but. and so that's what they look like. And we have uh, this is the morphism in here. These morphisms from n to n plus one, which just uh, well, I mean, we have one one element here that will not be in the image because you only have uh, n plus one elements here and n plus two in here, and we can choose which one to leave away, and the rest we can spread out. Right? That's one. Let's call these. Uh, what are these standard names? I have. Uh, yeah, the other Delta. One. Yeah, but the other face maps? Yeah. Uh, Sigmas. Sigmas. Sigmas are the subjective ones, and deltas are the injective Thank ones. Uh, but in Delta. Yeah, in Delta. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so this would be the thing that maps one. Let's call it Delta I. One to I. To themselves, uh, zero to i, and then jumps. I hope I got it right now. Up to n, and uh, then plus one. So I leave out. Hmm, that's probably wrong. I should probably have left out the uh, the i. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Now. So that's one kind of morphism we have in here, in this little category. And there's another one which goes the other way around, n plus 1 to n, um, that identifies, it's called those sigma then, with uh, sigma i of i equals, I hope this is the right one now, it could be i minus 1. <laughs> So I, I merge two of these in the, in the sequence, and the rest uh, I just leave in their own and do not work anything. So what's, what's special about these? Every morphism delta is a composition of such. Thank <laughs> you. 
injected otherwise, I'm, I mean, I just uh, identified two of these and the others I just start at zero and at some point I state the same thing and then I go on. That point is I. Okay, so that's just a little combinatorial category. What can we do with it? One considers functors from here to, to other places, for example, sets. So that was uh, A, let's say, and this is B. It's a different set that will be the most uh, important occurrence, I guess. That's a functor, contravariant, and delta to set. Uh, let's call it X, maybe, with sense and to something we call X lower end. So, and we can specify such a functor by, by saying what it does to the object, of course. So we have to give this, this list of sets. And what it does to these generating morphisms. Because that's, all the rest is then determined because the rest are composites of these. And if we draw it like this, all that we have uh, to specify is, is a diagram like this. We have a set x0, set x1, set x2, and so on. And now um, we have two possibilities to map 0 to the to the set zero uh, to the set one, right? Can map it to the first or to the second thing. So that makes two maps in here. We have three possibilities to map these two to here. We can have three places we can leave out, and so on. There's there's one more at each level. So we've got well. I mean, among, among these delta i, right? And the other way around, but here we only have one, one way, right? This is, this is one element, there's only one possibility. Here we can choose where, where to uh, stay for one round and then go on. And we have uh, two choices, either a zero or a one. So that makes two arrows backwards and so on. And there's one arrow appearing more in each level. Now for a contravariant functor, we get everything backwards. So we've got arrows like this. And other arrows like this. And they have to satisfy some relations. Yeah, if you, if you look at what happens to these. Sorry? I'm only drawing the interesting arrows. Yes. Yes, yes. So these are enough to specify a solution set. But you cannot just write down any maps here, they have to satisfy some relations. I mean, if you compose two of these delta i's, then, uh, then go back, for example, then maybe you can cancel one of them. And so there's, there's relations that, that just hold in this category. But if your maps that specify here satisfy those relations, then you have some different set. Okay, so why should that be interesting? We use it as a, as a blueprint for building topological space. So, also, well, we just imagine that we build our space out of simplices. Uh, let's call it like that one. Well, another definition, I guess. <coughs> the n simplex. <coughs> it's a topological space. It's, let's call it delta n with a, with a double bar here. And that's just the set of points R to the n plus one, um, such that all the xi's are 
coordinates between 0 and 1, and the sum of the xi's equals 1. So that doesn't tell you much, maybe. Here's one simplex. Now we have two coordinates here, the, the x0 and the x1 coordinate. Um, both have to be between 0 and 1, and the sum has to be 1, so that's exactly this little bit piece here. That's delta 1, it's just a line segment. Delta 2, now I have three coordinates, and they sit around uh, 3 like this with a triangle. And you mean less than or equal, right? Right, I think. Yeah. yeah. And so on. So these are the topological simplicities. And we can uh, build topological spaces by sticking together such simplicities. They are like Lego building blocks for topological spaces. And so we imagine, if you, if you give a simplicial set, we imagine these here as collections of simplices and the maps as gluing data that tell us how to stick them together. So if we have a one simplex, then we have two maps down here. One tells us where it starts and one where it ends. It's sort of a, you can see it as an oriented. If we have an element in here, we, we imagine it as a, as a two simplex. And we have three borders of this. Yeah? We can map, we get a, out of this, we get a one simplex, this one, this one, this one, that's three so one simplex that we map down here. And so on. We have, here we have tetrahedra, and then I can no longer draw anything. And we've got four faces of a tetrahedron, so you see this is numbering as it goes on. And now if I have Two one simplices floating around here. Ah, I have the source and the target here. Source and the target as specified by these maps. And it happens that these targets go to the same simplex here. Then I could just say, okay, I, then I glue these two things together. And they should stick together in my, my space. And that's how I can sort of use this kind of diagram as a blueprint for, for gluing a space. More formally, um, give us a little set x dot. So we have this whole collection here of, of sets, and we have the face maps and the degeneracy maps. And let's not care about the degeneracy maps. Um, it's Realization is the following thing, you can write it like this with bars around it. And you do just what I, what I said here, just write it down formally. For every natural number, you take, for every n here, you take the n simplices, and it takes a set of n simplices, we take the nth set in your substitution set, and imagine it as a collection of n simplices, that means for every element, Take an actual delta m, and then I glue them as my maps tell me. Maybe add brackets uh, before the slash sign, so that it's clear that uh, yeah, and then even more brackets. Oh, I see. Thank you. Yeah, that is true. Yes. Yeah. So I did it wrong. Yeah. Well, well. <laughs> but yeah, you, that's it didn't specify it. That's yeah. Something yeah. 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 Yes. So this this, this relation uh, should identify the simplices as the <coughs> as prescribed by these phase degeneracy maps. If I would be talking about fixed maps, then actually brackets could have been here, but. All right. Well, 
So the phase maps are the ones going downstairs, which give you give us the phases of, of uh, indices. Yeah. So this feature here has, has four phases, which mean, means uh, the four two simplices uh, that I get by applying this four. Okay, so that's that's a simple set, and that's uh, the role it often plays in Polish. It's a sort of a combinatorial gadget that can serve as a building plan, as a blueprint for building topological space. Okay. It can serve from, for much more things, actually, but that's one thing. Okay, so can you do the torus? The torus? Yeah. Model it just by a simplicial set, you mean? Yeah. I guess, I mean, the simplest. Yeah. If not, then no. I'm now asking whether that's a thread, and I can use this decomposition or not, but I guess. That's the decomposition of the torus if I if I identify these two and these two, right? And let's say do that. So I should have two elements in X2, let's call them these two simplices A and B. Then I should have three maps to one simplices. And let's call them, you know, we, we see uh, five right here, but actually these are the same users, so there should be three elements. Uh, let's call them, I don't know, x, y, and z. This is also y, this is also x. And, I mean, uh, let's call this here p1, p0, sorry. D1, D2. Well, let's say this one is the zero, this is the first, and this is the second. Okay? So then you know how to what to map where. I mean this is D0 of A, D1 of A, D2 of A. And there should also be something of B as you see it here, right? So this should be uh, d1 of uh, d0 of b, d1 of b, and d2 of b. Should I write down? Okay. What? Why is d0 of b and d2 of b? And then I only have one point. All of these. Let's call it w. So I don't have any choice but to map things. That looks like the torus to me. And then, okay, I didn't. I only uh, marked the so-called non-degenerate simplices. So I also have these backward maps. And so this forces me to to be able to see the point also as a degenerate one simplex. So I should add another thing for this W here, which then in the serialization business would be modded out again. Yeah, I should have not said simplicial set, but it's, that's the thing that you use in practice. Uh, there's a weaker word where you say delta set and only have the downwards maps. And uh, so that would be the category of injective order preserving maps, just as we next schedule. That would be enough to glue everything that you want. But any book you open will use simplicial sets, so that's what I chose to introduce. So, really, I should uh, join here another image of W, here another other images of X, Y, Z, and W. So we pass things upstairs here. And so, what I would like to do is, is say, from X3 on, everything is empty, but now I have to, like, from X3 on, everything comes just from below, with all these degenerate copies, lower dimensional symbols. If that, but it's okay, you know, if you think about this as a, as a topological space or something, it's a blueprint for realizing, it's okay to not 
think of the degenerate synthesis. You just think. And everything's empty up here. Maybe just for fun, uh, we could add the co end formula for the um, geometric realization. Uh, okay. It's uh, integral. Um, and on the top of that integral sign, we have uh, lowercase n, the, 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 the dimension n. Okay, and then we have um, uh, xn times um, delta n. Yeah, that's it. Just for fun. Are you having fun? <laughs> I'm having fun <laughs> of my life. <laughs> yeah, Cohen is a special kind of co-limit and what I'm doing here is of course a big union and some identification. <laughs> I can replace this product here if I want also by. I don't know. It appears here too, so I don't have yeah. to replace it. Yeah. <laughs> it's still a code limit. If I want to see this here as a disjoint union, what's the point? Okay. Um, so that's how you can use sequential sets. Yeah, as building schemes <coughs> for for topological spaces. I'll erase this now if you don't object. Do you object, Daniel? Okay. <laughs> but you just violated the anonymity. <laughs> I violated what? The anonymity of the questioners. <laughs> uh, this is Daniel Kahn I was addressing. <laughs> 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 now you violated Daniel Ken. <laughs> but he can't complain anymore. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> Did he invent sequential sets? Possibly. I don't know. Um, I think so, yeah. I don't know. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah. I mean, since we are at it, and since some people didn't know singular homology, this is now very quick to introduce. Let's say, oh yeah, not an X again, let's say uh, we have a homological space. <coughs> then we get a simplicity set. So it's a simple set of singular simplices given by. <coughs> What is the nth set of simplices? And these are continuous functions from the n simplex to y. Uh, and I have to say, what are these uh, face maps, for example? Restrictions to some phase of this here. Well, then I get something. And I can restrict to n plus one phases here, so I get n plus one maps as I should. Finding singular homology is this now. I take this simple set. I should maybe write this dot here because I have my running index. Zero, and I have these maps here. 
Face maps, and I take the alternating. I take first uh, the free abelian group on top of every these sets here. So, you know, these these are usually the infinite huge sets, right? All maps from some infinite place here. Take Z to the this here. So, level wise. Three million group over this here. I just take every such simplex as a generator for a three million group. It's huge. I still know where to map these things. And then now I'm groups and I can uh, take the alternate sums of these general C maps. Complex, and that's we're still the same groups. Yeah, so this is here uh, like d zero minus d one, for example. This is d zero minus d one plus d uh, two, and so on. And you can show this uh, complex, meaning that the composition of two such maps is zero. That's due to the combinatorics of these uh, simplices and to the relations that we have really in finite uh, ordered sets. Let's say it's composition. Complex means two consecutive maps get zero. And from complex, I can take homology, and so just take a kernel modulo image at every place. And that's single homology. Of course, it doesn't tell you how to compute it. What it is. So here you see there's nothing happening, but it's always called the bridge. Okay, so Now at least we have one commodity theory <laughs> defined because we are going about this uh, or what is all this abstract picture where they fit in, at least now we have one. That's homology. Cohomology would would go about by first applying hom to z to every the, every these, these uh, groups here in the complex. So the appears here to that. So then the arrows get turned around. And then we get a co chain complex and co homology. Gives us the co homology before. Now that's defined too. Okay. Okay, so this tells us, to begin with, that this uh, simplicial set that we can build out of a space knows everything that we need to know for homology. It's defined in terms of that, of course. It knows much more, in fact, and that uh, now gets us back a bit to, to the, where the lecture is going. 
Um, Wait, where do, let's say, um, well, both ways. This one's maybe interesting. So, the smoothest way to actually define all of this would not be by hand, but maybe then it's more confusing but by general injunction machinery, but so first of the fact, so this geometric realization that I defined before, the gluing of simplices, and this scene here are adjoined to each other. So this one is left adjoined. That's pointed from spaces to simple sets, and that's pointed from simple sets to spaces. And so, as for any adjunction, we have a co-unit that would be a map in spaces for every space y. And this is a weak equivalence. I remember you. Know, this means that it induces uh, isomorphisms on all higher homotopy groups and lower. So uh, I won't prove it, but. You can, I mean, what's the map? This at least you can see. So, this thing is built out of, you have here, we have continuous maps from delta n to y, and for each, and these here across the delta n. And then, when you do something, So given such a pair here, that's the regression. If we just apply this function to, to a point here, the relation map, that's what we get. F and some point x and some delta here, class of this, take some representative and we f of x will be here. In fact, Meaning it's a pair n class. And um, the starting space y can it be an arbitrary, totally arbitrary topological space or a CW? Yes. No, okay. anything. anything. In fact, this is a CW approximation of an arbitrary space mm -hmm. because what you get here is a CW. Mm -hmm. Okay. Co-fiber replacement and some model structures and get to top. So, I mean, before I told you that, of course, I mean, by definition now, uh, this the simple set sing y for space y knows everything you need to know about homology or cohomology. But actually, uh, it remembers completely the, the isomorphism class in this category uh, of, of spaces modulo weak equivalences. Mm -hmm. right? And so we are getting closer to a phenomenon that we will come back to. That's where we have the other construction too. I mean, out of the simplicity set, we can make a space by this realization functor. Um, and we have also the unit for this junction. So another fact, we have some simplicity set. You know, it's, a, it's an element in this functor category set to delta of. We can take its geometric realization and then think of it it's also a weak equivalence, but we didn't define this yet. Mm -hmm. And okay, so there is uh, there are some, some concrete ways to define actually what that would mean uh, for just using a substitute set. But I do the cheap trick and say, okay, uh, Um, well, 
let's say that a map of some digital sets so because if there are limitations. You know, some digital sets are at this point if we just want to use them as, as models of cosmological spaces. This is what we would want to know about some digital sets, whether these things are after realization. So we can do that. And now this, this other fact tells us, uh, well, if, if we take the realization and then go back to some digital sets, we also haven't lost anything. So if we realize it again, we, are, we end up with the same space. So, so this is a, a shadow of the fact that these two things sort of uh, define the same homotopy theories. I mean, there's a more refined statement about this, which we'll come to. I mean, this should maybe even follow already. So we can take topological spaces. in the sense of our localization. And we can do the same with some visual sets. To the minus one. Thank you. <laughs> These are equivalent categories. So sort of we can, if we only are interested the things up to be equivalent, then we can replace one by the other. That's not, I mean, there are better statements than this, but this is the first good statement, actually. So why, why is this, uh, can we actually already deduce it from this junction and this, these two facts? I'm not sure, yes, I guess we can, but maybe we can do this better after, uh, after this lecture. So let's postpone. So, but this highlights the fact, you know, I mean, we saw, so far we have seen uh, relative categories. So, a category with a given class of morphisms which we want to invert or want to see as weak equivalences. And different such categories can present the same, the same outcome, right, after inversion. find motion later. And that's actually a good thing. So that's, that's something you do in practice. I mean, topological spaces, that's, that's why I really, if you, if you insist, you will catch me having no clue about topological spaces, because I always use special sets because they're a much better category. And they are just, yeah, there, there's no difference if I want to do homotopy theory. Okay. I have all the information in here too. And it's a pre-sheaf category. It's, Presentable, complete, co complete, whatever I want. And for top, you have to work a lot to make it work. Mm -hmm. So, in this lecture, top is again top, or the top <laughs> you define as W complex? Um, here, what top it doesn't is? matter, actually. Okay. Uh, because the equivalence between CW complexes is the same as a zone of equivalence. And well, every, uh, so that's another fact that we get from here. Every topological space Y is weakly equivalent to a CW complex because this is one, because I have glued it out of cells. Mm -hmm. And so that means yeah, I, I got the same class of objects in the end. Yeah, so things start not to matter anymore. If I insist on just wanting to invert uh, home to equivalences, between topological spaces, then I'm somewhere else. We cannot mm -hmm. model through this, I think. Mm -hmm. You can, but you don't usually. Mm -hmm. 
And how hard is it to prove that that fact? Ah, not super hard. Okay. I I don't know. I mean, that's that's all I remember about it. <laughs> I didn't seem to suffer a lot. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't recall how exactly it did it. I read that in May's opera of Spring on Eternals mm -hmm. in 1971, I think, back in the days. Yeah, I don't know. Never mind. Okay. Yeah, so. <coughs> We will need some sites anyway, we can't escape them. And the resolutions of things. Okay, so now the break, I saw you were just discussing derived functors. Let's do that too. So back to localization, yeah? We had uh, the situation of a relative category. And we now know how to associate to it the localization, that which is technically a functor like this. And yeah, well, this this is where we turned <coughs> forms of W to isomorphisms. So what do we do now with this? Now we have some uh, created a place where our notion of equivalence became the usual one, became the notion of isomorphism in the best way possible. And we want to work there. Okay, so first. Uh, Big disappointment is it's you cannot really work in there <laughs> alone. So what what do you what might you want to do? You might want to uh, compute limits and colimits in there. That's something you do in every category, and they don't really exist there usually. So there's there's a formal statement saying telling you that if they exist, then you were in some situation like that reflexive subcategory situation before. And really in in all other situations this just doesn't happen. There will be lacking limits and colimits, and you cannot really say what to do there. So, but usually we come from a category which is not that bad. Yeah. We start with somewhere in algebra and or topology, and then we have our constructions. We would like to make them meaningful up to equivalence and pass them on down here. How do we do that? Um, well, given two localizations here, let's say we have a C and a D, functor F, and we localize both these categories. Then, of course, if, if this here um, since weak equivalence is here, takes from W to isomorphisms, by the inverse property, we will have factorization. But this often doesn't happen. So this would sort of mean that we have uh, yeah that the equivalences here are respected by by the f. But the, this is a function between categories which in, in themselves don't know anything about our chosen class of morphisms. So there's no reason. Example. Uh, I 
I at some point I was numbering things. Let's go back to numbering things. Um, so here's a standard example. Let's look at the following diagram on top. Now we have the circle as one, and we can include it as the border of the disk twice, and do push out. What does that mean? Yeah, we, we have two copies of the disk and we glue them along the common border that, that is this S1. We get a two sphere. S2. Right? You can neatly illustrate that with an Überraschungs eye. Yep, two helps. Is this commonly known in Italy? I don't know. <laughs> Some of us. It's German suite for children. Yeah. So what we're looking at here is, is uh, the co-limit functor, the push-out functor. Where is it defined? It's defined on this functor category, top, to the, the I take a little index category, consisting of three objects and two arrows and, and three identities, of course. And I have the co-limit functor. In this case, push-out, it goes to top. Yeah? So it takes a... It's such a diagram and maps it to the push out. And forgets the rest. So I should maybe delete that part that I forget. Okay, that's that's a thing we definitely want to do. We want to glue spaces from from simple pieces and so on. That I mean that's what we just did with with the simplicial sets and simplices. So this uh, unfortunately does not respect equivalences, and so we cannot pull off this trick here and pass it pass it down steps. So what are equivalences of diagrams? These are just object-wise, yeah? If, if, I have a, if I have a diagram and want to replace it, object, 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 wise. So if I have a diagram like this, and then a map of diagrams, that means that everything here can use. Yeah? So this is my second diagram. A prime, B prime, C prime. And I have three equivalents connecting these two. Then the co-limits can be different and really non-equivalent. And here's the example. So let's take just S1 again. And let's take the one point space here. Yes, that's another diagram. Well, that's this will be the snap. The identity is definitely a weak equivalence. Uh, the disk is contractible. So it has zero homotopy groups everywhere. It's connected. So these are all equivalences. Maybe I should, uh... But now taking the push out of the second thing, well, we grew a point and a point along whatever, we get a point. But Okay, we have a map induced by the push out, but this is not an equivalent because S2 has a non trivial homology or whatever you want to matter about. Okay, so that's a totally sensible construction in topological spaces, which we also do want to perform in homotopy theory, and it's not constructible this way. Here. Maybe one, maybe another one. All the time is running. Okay. 
Still on top, we do the same as limits. Just because it's good to know these, these instances of this general term. <coughs> also, it will be good to know this for the actor cause, I think. So I have to know what to do then in the end to remedy these shortcomings. So, of course, I can take limits of such diagrams. Yeah, now, now the arrows point towards a common object, and I can take a pullback. And again, I uh, can take contractible spaces and I'll get something different. So what do I do? Maybe maybe I take this. Yeah, let's just take this. Um, let's take this one here. Let's take one point spaces going anywhere and this one here. Well, let's say they go to the same point, then the pullback is a point, otherwise it would be empty. Could, on the other hand, replace. Well, let's, let's maintain two of these things, but replace this one here by the real numbers. It's a contractible space again. So now I have. Take the uh, exponential maximum. This should be the universal <coughs> covering of the circle. Okay. If I see the circle as the as a unit uh, length complex numbers, then this would be e to the i. And if I take the pullback of this, yeah, what do I do here? It's, it will be the pre-image of, of my point where I map to. It will be infinitely many points, right? No longer this here. It will be like Z. It's a, it's a discrete space disjoint union of. Well, and I have of course this induced map by the pullback, but it's definitely not a equivalent because I have many more connected components. Mm -hmm. Do I do the third example? Maybe I should. Let's, uh, well, top is a great place to work, and the same would work in top, what I do now, but let's uh, change to something in category of categories and equivalences as, as the weak, well, categorical equivalences as the weak equivalences. So, um, I specify and write down all the objects as like this. Uh, a category is given by, by class of morphisms and class of objects. And it's more target maps and, of course, composition and so on, and identity maps, but this is the thing I, I write down in notation now. Okay, so if you're in doubt what I'm doing, then, then ask me again, but we just start and then you see. So, let's take some group G. Then I can form a category, can form two categories actually. One is where the morphisms are G cross G. Objects are G. And on one side, I have the projection to the, let's say, first factor. And on the other side, I have the multiplication. How can I picture it? I have for every element of G, I have an object. Okay. Two prime, two primes. And 
what are the morphisms from G, G to G prime? That would be something with source G and target G prime. So the source map is this first projection. So that would be a pair where the first thing is G. And the second thing is what I get by multiplying uh, this G with the second thing. So this should be uh, G to the minus one G prime. Mm -hmm. It's some definition of a category, a small category. So the group is small. And that's, yeah, that's how you see these move. Okay. So, now observe that for every pair of objects, G and G prime in EG, there's a unique morphism between them. And it's an isomorphism. I can, of course, go backwards here by just writing G prime and G prime and minus one G. For every two objects here, there's a unique thing I can do. Because the source is, is of course, determined, and then the other thing is also determined, there's a unique thing I have to multiply this with to get to the second. It's a group. I think the identities are given by G, comma, neutral element, instead of G, G. That's true, thank yeah. you. I mean, it doesn't really matter what. Oh, it's important. Yeah. I mean, it's wrong otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so what does this tell us? EG is equivalent to the one point category. Category with one object and uh, identity. It's, it's more physical. Okay, we had another construction of category, so that's one. I'm, I'm out again setting up a pullback example here. Let's call it BG. That's the category with G as morphisms and only one object. That's something we had before. Uh, that was, uh, we, we did it with monoids before for the localizing example, right? So, these morphisms and multiplication uh, gives composition, right? And we have a functor, EG, BG. What does it have to do? It has to map morphisms to morphisms and objects to objects. Well, an object there's no choice, it's just one. The morphisms, now I have to think. I guess I should project to the second one, right? OK, 
Okay, third category to form pullback, that would be just the one point category. There's only one functor that has to map the identity to the identity here. And now let's take the pullback. That should be everything I find on top of this identity here. That should be category, should be a discrete category. It has G many objects and only identities between them. Yeah, I mean, how many objects do I have about this? G, of course. That's, that part is okay. It's really just a letterwise pullback. And how many morphisms do I have over every uh, given morphism G here? Well, it's just, I mean, I, I took one factor and it has to be just the other that I can choose. And I meant this as a An example of how um, uh, yeah. the uh, top left category, yes. uh, the morphism of uh, the element G. Is it the entire group G or? Okay. So the, the class of all morphisms is, is the group G, and the class of all objects also. So these are just the identities. It's also target are the uh, identity maps. So it's a discrete category. It's really a set okay. disguised as a category. And it's the set G and the right set of the group. Mm -hmm. There happens to be a group object in CAT, <laughs> which, <laughs> but let that not. Uh -huh. I would want to say, don't let that confuse you, but actually that's that's the whole point of the example. <laughs> It'll come later. <laughs> uh, okay, so on the other hand, well, we can replace this one here again by the one point category, right? And the pullback will again be just one point category. Because you do pullbacks in category really level wise. You do pullbacks of the of the morphisms and of the objects, and if you just have one point categories here, then there's nothing to do. And they do happen to go to the same thing. Otherwise it'd be empty. Mm -hmm. In any case, or not to group, we'll never get this here. Okay, so three uh, examples of failure. So what do we do about it? Can you erase this? Or are there still questions while it's still All the answers are your right functors. <laughs> so we don't get our, our co-limit or limit constructions. That's what I'm, I'm at now. Ah, maybe actually there's a fourth example that would really be hooking up later. Maybe it's Yes, later. So the remedy for this and we have functors. So back to our situation, we have a functor f from c to d, and we have these localizations here, and f does not respect them in general. So the next best thing that we can do is, so, so what we don't get is a, is a functor here that makes this whole thing commute. So the next best thing that we can do is a can extension. What does that mean? It's, uh, let's do this one. It's a universal natural transformation that I can fill to this square. So this I would call, so let's call this here uh, L prime, and this L. So there's two, two uh, varieties. There's left and right count extension. And I'll tell you what that means. And 
the prime of this f along with that. Well, that means I fill in a, a initial transformation here such that for every other this should be uh, this then called it's to the right one run l l prime f that's the notation for it so that means for any other such situation unfortunately I didn't leave enough space here so I have to go again some other functor here, g, plus the natural transformation here, from this composite to that composite. Now, then I have my, my given natural transformation, and it will be composite of, of one, run, of a, comp of a decimal transformation from g to this run, together with that. <laughs> it's hard to swallow at first, I admit. Uh, let's do this in red here, maybe. So that means it's actually not we, we'll see the practice, so maybe you don't despair if this Abstract now. So given such a, a G and such an extra transformation here, there is a unique uh, well, not color. Let's do curly. Here you go. Ah, right. mm. Well, that's a unique, well, now it's a curly arrow. Here equals that one. <laughs> That's not the most uh, <coughs> easy thing to swallow. There's very nice examples of this, and if, if our categories have to be co-complete, where we are, you know, it's uh, a red fine so complete maybe. Uh, then there's very nice constructions of this, and you really can start seeing what, how they work. But, as I said, this thing is almost never complete. So we have to get our conic standards in some different way. In particular, it's not obvious that they exist, right? No, absolutely not. Yeah. And they won't in general. Yeah. Double arrow as a natural transformation. Yes. And they need not be natural isomorphisms. Yes. They won't be usually. Yeah. But what we do want them to be in the end uh, will be level wise with equivalence in our. Mm -hmm. this, uh, yeah, no, no, they will arise from such. I mean, here they don't need to be. Yeah. And uh, I think if L is fully faithful, then um, the natural morphisms are natural isomorphisms, right? I think this is a the totally general result about con extensions. I mean, it's not of relevance here because our L will never be fully faithful, but... Um, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Okay, suppose now the following. Um, so 
suppose we have a subcategory here on which F does preserve the equivalences. <coughs> I don't know, uh, C tilde, C, that F there does preserve the equivalences. Where did you find this draw? In more somewhere? Here, yeah, of that laptop. I found that in Augsburg. Ooh. <laughs> I could have put even an orange on I could have brought you some. Thank you. <coughs> oh, on one hand there. And such that. Uh, so that's, that's a condition on the objects really in here. You it's a full subcategory. Uh, let's make it full from the beginning, mm -hmm. and such that um, if we localize here, the function of the set. What? Ah, weak equivalences. Ah, okay. I got shorter and shorter in my notation. Sorry. And such that every uh, object here in my localized category can be represented by one from C tilde. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, I mean, a priori, this usually will be a special subclass of objects, maybe. But then we insert new uh, isomorphisms, and now it could happen that everything in C becomes isomorphic to one of those little categories, those little uh, collection of objects. And then, we could um, if just define our F there, you know? Our restricted F it goes to D with the localization, and we have Till localized, which is same as C localized. And then we do have a map, right? Well, the obstacle for this here was that there were some objects where it didn't respect the equivalence. But if here it does, then we can. And on the other hand, Yeah, so you can say that, so this, this covers every case that we want to cover downstairs here, because we have the same categories. And, and we know now how to define all functor downstairs. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I want to do this proof in the lecture, but we can, it's maybe a good thing for some other day. If this, no, I think this Uh, more coherent still. I uh, just said there should be this category such that F restricted is fine. Everything is somehow equivalent to something in there. Let's make this a bit more functorial. Then it's, it's actually easy to prove. Reasonably easy. Uh, 
So a fun flow which puts us into this subcategory. And then I, I left followed by the occlusion, so it becomes an endofunctor. Plus natural transformation. to the identity from tau which is optic rise of weak fluences. this um, set W where we localize I should have introduced it for there's a so-called two of three condition it says if we have a, a diagram like this and that's a G and they're composite Two of these are equivalences, and the third one should also be. <coughs> it's a totally harmless condition, as long as you're interested just in the localization functor, because uh, this is true for isomorphisms. And if, if we turn two of these into isomorphisms down here, then the third one also must become an isomorphism. And so we can enhance our W if you want up, up here and then without changing the localization. Mm -hmm. uh, well then, Supposing that this that F preserves equivalences between objects in C tilde, right? Um, well, if we have this, the front of Q itself preserves equivalences. Uh, why? Well, if we have an equivalence from some X to some Y, then we get U of x, and we have this natural transformation tau of x, which is an equivalent goes to x. This is natural, we have the square here. And this is an equivalent, and then we have two of three for this composite, and this, and this. Right? between objects in C and tilde, and that's where we land by applying Q. And therefore, we have the following diagram and we have our Q here, our transformation here. We have functor, we have our localization. This is a well, OK, 
okay, now this, this lower thing here preserves weak equivalences, finally, because we first put things, well, that's what I'm saying. So there exists a thing, and that is the right kind of center that we are looking for. Mm -hmm. The right kind of L along L prime F. Run more. Stick to more mutation. Mm -hmm. And I said that we have a universal transformation. That's this thing here. Now this, I can see this as a whole transformation between this point and this. Yeah, it's just, just that composed with a lot of identities. Mm -hmm. And uh, back there, where we uh, at the top square, um, was this also a kind extension? Here. Yes. Uh, no, I don't think in general. I mean, yeah, in okay. this situation, with when when our C tilde really uh, needs to be mapped to coherently somehow. Okay. So just yeah. It was just the pre-observation that if we have a subcategory where F preserves weak bullets, then we already have functor here, and then mm -hmm. it's such a that we can hope for an extension, and here now we... Okay, good, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's, this is the completely dry thing, and if you want, that's, that's a thing we can do, so the proof of this theorem is a thing we can do in between the lectures. Mm -hmm. It's not too hard. Uh, I can, like, Probably make this an exercise to ask me for hints and then do it. Or not ask me for hints. But I mean, only do this if you are fond of abstract nonsense and categorical diagram pasting. Okay. So, examples. I mean, this is nobody can understand this the way it's written. Well, we have this whole functor. Right? Push out functor from top to this with these diagram shapes on top. And we have a fact. That uh, push outs preserve influences between diagrams of good shape. are co-vibrations, and this thing is co -fi. Oh, we are on top of everything, I don't know, yeah, it's a condition actually. Where A is, let's say a CW complex, just, just say everything is CW complexes, then we don't have to say that, okay. Call what co are? Of course, that was my next. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's a more abstract definition in terms of homotopy extension properties, and uh, which makes sense in many categories, and it's used in many categories. And there's the concrete thing, since we are here for a concrete example. Uh, They are inclusions of subspaces. Now let's, let's roll them. We have uh, A and B, for example, with its G. So it has an image here. And they are inclusions of subspaces such that around the image there's still a neighborhood 
which retracts onto it. So it's inclusion associated with, with lots of space around it still. So the image has a neighborhood. of this and see why they're equivalent. Let's leave it at this now for the moment. Actually let's delete all of this. that this is a, an, uh, an example of this situation of the theory that I stated before. So, yes? Uh, the screen is uh, like sure. You say about uh, um, a good inclusion and then you would have... That's it. That's the one. Thank you, yes, for reminding me. of Okay, now we have to fight with the top group group. Uh, every uh, map of topological spaces. Factors as a as co vibration followed by weak equivalence. Space in the middle and some cooperation, some equivalence here. And what do I do? I just take the so called mapping cylinder, MF, that is formally defined as uh, x cross the unit interval, union y, and I identify uh, a copy of x at the bottom with the image. And why? Draw it. Yeah, so if I have x is my block with stripes, and y is this, and then it has some possibly distorted image in here. And I take x across the unit level, then I get a cylinder like this. At the bottom, I identify with its image in, in Y. And this Y I glue to the bottom. Okay, so and here I take the, as inclusion, I take X as the top thing of the cylinder. This will map X to X comma one. And then you can see that there's a co vibration. Why? Because I, I have I'm sitting up here and there's a little neighborhood around it that retracts onto it. There's lots of space. And you can see that this here is a. Well, what, what is the map first? This here just maps uh, things from downstairs to themselves and everything else. Their image in Y. So it sort of uh, flattens down the cylinder here. 
and that is, a, is an equivalence because all I'm doing here, I mean, what means equivalence? There's a homotopy to the, well, if I, I can go back actually. So there's a homotopy to the identity that goes here and here. It's, it is an identity, I mean, an inclusion, correct? And the other way around, yes, I have a homotopy that by shrinking this gradient down, it includes the image. So that's a factorization that I have. Actually, the proof of effect, that's how we do it. Now, together with this unproven fact here that uh, diagrams consisting of co vibrations uh, are okay for this correlated functor and that it, it preserves the on this on these diagrams, it gives us the recipe. The derived point of push out. And it's called a multiple push out. It works as follows you, uh, you start with some diagram. A, B, C. You factorize the morphisms which occur in there. Let's call this one here, well, it's equivalent to B, it's called B tilde. Factorize the morphisms and then take the push out of the just the first part. Then. So this thing, I start with this and then I, I factorize and then I get another, let's say this here is, is, is D, and this here will be Q of D, that's my replacement function. Factorize and just take this corner here, and then I apply my push out, my colon. And then I'm in this, this ratio of the sphere. So if we go back to this example, where the, we saw that the co-limit or this push-out is not a, an equivalence-preserving functor on these diagrams. Well, what were our diagrams? We have S1, and then the disk, elemental disk, B2, B2, and we had uh, the other comparison thing was the point. Uh, let's, let's take it a little differently. So that's the thing we had. Cylinder, and then I identify the bottom with, the, with its image. That's just a point, right? So it's sort of the cone here. And then I will, so this is my co vibration here, the circle goes in the top, and then this is contractible back to a point. And then I take a push out, and this is two I had before. That's Uh, 
Yeah, these are just disks. So the, the one, the first one was the good one, and this this other one was the bad one. This is the derived show. And yeah, maybe a remark. I mean, I said that we are constructing Khan extensions. What we did here was a right Khan extension. That's maybe something you don't expect. So, column is a left join. This is given, homotopy column is given by a right Khan extension unexpectedly. How can you memorize that? Well, the right Khan extension maps through the functor. And the original push out functor was this here, and that's, that's the way our transformation goes. That's the way. So, but. Uh, Likewise, we had this pullback example, right? For this, you have to place your maps here by vibrations. That's sort of a dual notion, it's co vibration notion. This functor is derived. My so called vibrations. Uh, that means well. It's a uh, homotopy lifting property. So if I have a <coughs> map here, it's a vibration if and only f if. Now if I can uh, include x here at the zero coordinate in this x cross the uh, unit interval. So if I have a map through e to b, uh, and a homotopy downstairs to something else, then I can lift it here. That's what it needs to be a vibration. And there's another factorization, like just we had, as we had it here by Vatnik's windows, there's path spaces which give you a factorization into, into uh, a weak bullet followed by a vibration. The dual thing happens, that's how you derive pullbacks, for example. Maybe it's not the time to, to expand on this, but let's do it in the breaks and with examples. Of three days. And maybe to the category example. It now are sort of factorization systems into co vibrations of vibrations, co vibrations followed by equivalences, or vibrations preceded by equivalences, so that you can derive these things. And that's something that has been formalized. So you, that's something that uh, has been done in abstract homotopy theory. Sort of say what you need, what kind of replacement functors you need to derive your constructions. And um, other example that we have here now for this thing. On cat, category of categories, we have um, co-fibrations. Well, that's one possible structure. There will be more. But actually, Well, we took the one with category equivalences. And this would be functors which are mm -hmm. 
Injective on Objects. Vibrations. Pointers which are Maybe I should know uh, the names. I'm just from C to D inducing surjection on isomorphisms. Yeah, so every isomorphism in D who's uh, okay, I'm not quite precise here. Such that one, the, the starting object or the target object lies in the image of C should also lift. with these notions of co-vibration, vibration, and the usual notion of equivalence. In this style here, maybe. Mm -hmm. I, again, forgot to read numbers. I learned a trick what you can do when you forget numbers. Namely, you simply skip to the next order number, so to omega. Ah, I see. And then it's omega plus one, omega plus two. At some point, you will forget whether it was omega plus seven or omega plus eight. But then you simply skip to omega times two. And that's, that's yeah. great, actually. I learned this from Matthias Hutzler. Let's do that. <laughs> Unless somebody tells me what it is and wants it to be a finite number. That way, it's also more impressing to our friends at home. That's true. But we did omega many exercises. Please don't tell me what the <laughs> number was. <laughs> so exercise fine factorizations, I mean, that's a good start. <clears throat> and actually, I think we can do something like this. Like in the light of these factorizations, um, I'm not sure. So I told you before that a localization, a strict localization of category C uh, with respect to some class W could be seen as a push out uh, for every arrow in W I uh, attach an inverse, right? Okay, so it, it can of course happen now that I uh, have several uh, equivalences between the same objects. So this will not be uh, injective objects. But if it is, then this strict push out uh, oh, what can I conclude from this? <laughs> well, I can conclude from this that it's that this somehow respects uh, equivalence. I can, I mean, I can always arrange my C such that, based by an equivalent one, such that this here becomes actually a, an inclusion on objects.
And I don't know what this points mean, sorry. <laughs> but think again is never never wrong. Yeah. <laughs> think deeply about subject X. I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of equivalent formulations, right? I mean, sometimes you can like demand natural isomorphisms here for your vocalization and so on. You can ask for a week to push out, you can reformulate these conditions. And I'm suspecting that should tell us something, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Anyway, thank you again. Yes. Okay, so now we have five minutes. I'll just uh, end with another example. So now we have just been talking about limits and co-limits and also derive other functors. And yeah, I should actually, since that's what you did in the break, I should now come to a more algebra, right? On the other hand, what I need further on is, is a different thing. Maybe I do just both. Um, so here's another example. Um, homotopy quotients. and equivariant maps to respect this G-action. These are just the underlying equivalences. If I just ignore that they are even there. Okay, so I have the functor from G top to job top which quotients by a G action. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question about what I wrote here? Uh, it's category of topological spaces with a G action. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, right, that was missing. So I have the quotient functor. That is something we know uh, sort of can go wrong morally if you take quotients of two bad actions. And, well, you can invert these equivalents. Usually, the equivalent is here. And, Again, we have something that doesn't respect equivalence. This is something we should derive. And your W is a V? Yeah. Or oh, no, no, the W at the, uh, at the lower right. But it's the v, w from uh, back before, right? So just yeah, the v usually equivalences. equivalences. <coughs> yeah. But that we always use on top. Yeah. And now here I have to say, because it's the first time this appears, it's also the equivalence, but on the underlying spaces. I mean, you just. Yeah. It's also w if you want, if you don't mind the clash of notation. But it's not really w because just it consists of. 
the morphisms consist of different uh, sources and targets. Once it's uh, on the right hand side, it's spaces, and on the left hand side, it's space include with an a G action. But we ignore the T action? Yeah, for defining. Yeah, it's just wiki equivalences again, yeah. on the underlying spaces. So yeah. we, we also have forgetful functor to here. Yeah. We just forget the G action and we take the pre image of wiki equivalences here. Yes. Yeah. But so the forgetful functor we look at now, yeah. that we don't have to derive now with this function. Yeah. <laughs> but we took a look at the potion functor. Uh, so, <coughs> pushing out the G action does not respect the weak equivalences. For example, let's take uh, S infinity. That's the colon in top of, of uh, all these spheres. So what I mean by this, well, what is S0? That's just two points. Yeah, it's the borders of the unit interval. And what is S1? That's uh, oh, it's a circle. Then okay, I should rather do it like this, sorry. Yeah. And I include this as the equator in the S2 and so on. I can always like uh, take one coordinate zero. Now these, these are the spheres in R to the n plus one. And I always can put this in, uh, to the next one. And this, the outcome here will be a contractible space. Why? Well, if you if you map any sphere, now so um, let's see, we have a map of two point. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> and if I map pi n, I have to see what this does on the on the pi n's. Well, pi n of the point is always zero. And this year, it's Computers of maps from S n to S infinity. Well, it will factor through one of these stages here. S n is compact; it has to factor somewhere. And uh, pi n of S uh, n plus one is already zero. Yeah? If, I, if I map a smaller sphere to a bigger one, then it's always contractible. It can never cover everything. That's actually a non-trivial fact that you prove by approximating it uh, smoothly. This map. Mm -hmm. So, but this is zero because every map in here will come from some, well, some, somewhere on the way. And plus k, and this here is already zero. Mm -hmm. So, well, all I want to say is this is a contractible space. We have a weak equivalence here. Weak contractible. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a weak equivalence. It's also actually probably really contractible, but whatever, we, we are using the other notion of equivalence right now. Yeah. Weak equivalence. That's what you can see easily. Uh, but now let's take uh, the quotient of both things. Ah, let's uh, act with Z2. Here, there's only one way to act, of course. Mm -hmm. Upstairs, I, uh, I multiply the coordinates here by, I should maybe start saying what I do here. I, on coordinates, I always add a zero. Mm -hmm. okay. Add some coordinates by multiplying by plus minus one. Mm -hmm. So let's take the quotient. 
mean, this year, module, module this trivial action will be itself, of course. Yeah. And as infinity, modulo this Zeno 2 action. What is it? Well, it's uh, opening out this group action as a left adjoint, if you think about it. So it will compute with this co limit. It's an actual co limit in, in, in top. Mm -hmm. I can do that. So I get co limit of. Uh, all these restricted actions. Mm -hmm. And that is co limit of, well, this has to be a point. Uh, this here is S1 again, but that's sort of, by definition, rather, it's uh, RP1 because I, I identify the directions mm -hmm. that, I, that I have in different directions here. So what appears over here when I, when I identify different directions in the sphere is, are the RPNs, the real projective spaces. And so this is RP infinity. <coughs> and now it's a fact that's actually proven by this construction sort of uh, that this one has homotopy group, non-zero. Fundamental group of R infinity is sigma two and not zero, which would be the fundamental group cause of the point and hence this other quotient, right? So these two spaces are not completely equivalent. Mm -hmm. Another possible point of discussion why well, this is true, if you want. This is sort of a side track, but why not? Okay, so uh, this yeah. whole group is just a group. Because you started with a topology group, it doesn't matter. Uh, here it's just similar to the discrete topological yeah. group, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But so for all that you said is completely irrelevant if she's topologi topological group. Uh, oh, okay. With, uh, you can just take a group acting on something. Well, I mean, that's that's a tough case of what I was saying. Continuous G action, I meant, so that the map G cross X to X should be continuous. So okay. if G is discrete, then that's no condition. Yeah. And if G is topological, so I'm covering more cases by saying continuous. Yeah. Or by saying the logical didn't thing. say it. I didn't. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> so, I mean, this is just an example of, of the fact that this again doesn't respect two equivalences. So, what have we have to do? We have to derive it. And again, we need such a fact that we can replace a, any G action by a good G action. Fact, quotient functor uh, respects equivalences um, between spaces with free G action. That means Three means uh, if I have any group element which has a fixed point, then it must be identity. It really throws everything around. And so what we have to do, we give any space, we have to replace it by a space with a free G action. And then apply the code function. We have this 
x, x with this the g. <coughs> we first make a simpler resolution. Now we are back to special objects. That's a good ending point, maybe. So we can see this as a constant simple object. We just have you know identity maps. One more at each level, but that doesn't matter. And replaced by the following simplicial space. Yeah, we have in each level now we have a simplicial, we have a, we have a space, topological space. It's not just a string set. And <coughs> throw in a wholly totally different kind of thing here. So here we have a Simplicial diagram topological spaces. It's called a simplicial space. It has a G action on each level. Uh, which is just the end of the action. So I act here on X as I did before and I just multiply on G. And that tells me because the, the action on G itself is free. That tells me that this whole thing is free. It's a free action on this simplicial thing. And Okay, if I really want to replace it by a single space, so I can already work with the simplicial thing if I want, I can take the homotopy co limit of this. So that's another thing I can do. Uh, I didn't tell you how to take, I told you how to take homotopy push-outs, but there's another recipe how to take homotopy co limits of simplicial diagrams. It's just a bigger diagram, but again, you just have to resolve things, uh, replace things by co-fibrations, blow up, glue in more space, as we did with the cylinder. So that's my thing with the free G action. I, I take the code and still will have a free G action, and that's my replacement. The outcome here will be a recuperate. It sort of is clear because this is, if you remember, you know, apart from the X part, we just have this thing here. And we have seen this part before, it was a contractible category. So this putting the, all these G's in there doesn't change the homotopy type. Mm -hmm. Just an intuition about it. Now I do, do the X everywhere. Then the whole type would be that of X. So this would be the mm -hmm. So let's call this thing here, I don't know, X tilde. And then we take O colon X tilde in top. <coughs> Um, it is a good replacement, so it's one with the free ejection. And that will compute the derived functor of taking the quotient. Okay, time to stop. Thank you.